Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and this is your Bible Study Wednesday. We are um, doing a special, uh, we put on hold our walk through the Bible that we've been doing for a few years, actually. We put that on hold it's, uh, during this December um, Advent, the four Wednesdays of Advent, and then the Wednesday uh, that we have after Christmas. So the five Wednesdays of December, we are doing the Gospel of Mark, which is the Gospel of the lectionary cycle for this year B that we just started. We finished chapters one through three. Today we start in chapter four and we'll go through the end of chapter six. So I'm trying to get this, this all in without taking up a whole hour. I prefer to get it done in 30 minutes, but I might go up to 45, but um, my goal is to keep it succinct so we won't be doing the uh, closing prayers of Compline uh, during this time. Uh, I encourage you to do that on your own. Mark chapter four. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching, he said to them. Now, so this is the first time that in, in Mark that Jesus actually does a teaching. He's been doing a lot of healings, uh, and the healings have been, um, you know, there have been exorcisms, uh, they've been uh, that kind of thing, uh, which have, have led to amazement from the people. It is also, at the end of those first three chapters, we start to see, like, he, started, he was starting to get some blowback from uh, the religious authorities, right? So this is actually the first time he actually just, you know, puts it out there, puts some teachings out there. And, um, uh, and, he, and he does it uh, beside the sea. And every time he's at the sea, uh, he's going to, uh, something significant happens. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But he's going to go into a very uh, familiar parable. And what Mark is doing here is he's trying to give us an example of like, uh, of like, okay, here's an example of the kind of thing that um, Jesus taught. Uh, so he doesn't give us a lot of parables, but he, just, he gives us a sampling, okay? Uh, verse three, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came up, came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30, 60, and 100 fold. By the way, anything above a seven fold, uh, seven fold was what was expected. So the 30, 60, 100, this is all extraordinary way huge, a lot bigger than they could ever imagine, okay? So, verse nine, and he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Mark is casting Jesus as a teacher who is, uh, he uses these agrarian, these folksy images but yet the depth of what is there is, it might not be obvious. And so that's what this kind of means. It's like, well, if you dare to really delve into what this means, then you've got quite a journey for yourself. Verse 10, when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the 12, asked him about the parables. Notice that it's the 12 and those who were about him. Um, uh, that kind of includes us. This is, a, this is Mark's way of uh, uh, putting us in that, that circle of, of, uh, of listeners, okay? Um, and, uh, and asked him about the parables, verse 11. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret, also mystery, the word mystery, of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed listen but not understand, so that they may not 
turn again and be forgiven. So we're on the insiders, okay? We're amongst the insiders. The outsiders, uh, it, for them, it's just like, oh, I can't figure out what the heck he's saying. But for the insider, we're actually supposed to be able to discern from the parables what it means. And here he gives us an interpretation or an example of here's what that parable means. So it's like, they don't necessarily, the people on the outside, they might not, they don't get this, what he's about to say, but we get it. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root and endure it only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30 and 60 and 100 fold. So Jesus gives them this, he reveals to them the mystery. To others, they don't get that, okay? They just get the parable and the, uh, oh, confusing. Verse 21, he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone who with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get and still more will be given you. For to those who have, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Here, Jesus is saying that uh, we are amongst the insiders. We've been given something, uh, we've been given this light uh, to, to, that we need to, 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 to display, uh, and no, the outsiders don't have this, we have this. And the measure you give, the measure you get, uh, the idea that we are that privileged a uh, few that, to which much is being entrusted, okay? Verse 26, he also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe at once, he goes in with a sickle because the harvest has come. This is an, uh, this parable right here um, is uh, another agrarian uh, image. But you know what? Uh, only only Mark has it. Mark is the only one who has this um, this this parable. It's very interesting because um, uh, all the other parables that we find in Mark, all of them, uh, Matthew and Luke used them. Not this one. Verse thirty. He also said. With what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? And it's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into the deep, I can't, I don't have time to go into the details of all of, of the parables, but the, <laughs> this was kind of a funny one because it's like, have you ever seen what a mustard seed does and it doesn't get that big uh, bird? Um, it's, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's another kingdom thing where it's like you get something that you don't, don't expect, basically, okay? Verse 33, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, uh, right? Um, he did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So the outsiders are the ones that, uh, that, that, that hear about this Jesus uh, and don't really understand him. We're amongst the people, uh, the privileged few who uh, get uh, the, the mysteries explained. Um, and 
it, it makes a, the, the narrator of Mark is clear to pull us in as the, as the, as the readers into the inner circle of uh, a Jesus' disciples, those who are about him. Verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. So he's going from a Jewish side of Lake, of, of lake Galilee, Sea of Galilee, it's not really a sea, it's a lake, uh, to the Gentile side. Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep in the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So he's going to the Gentile side. Jesus is going to take actions that's going to pull the Gentiles in to the same fold as the Jewish people. And guess what? It's a, it's a rocky road. It's a stormy sea to get to that side. Anytime you reach out and say, oh, these people who have, we have considered unclean and written them off and we're pulling them in and we're making, we're uh, practicing inclusion now with, with them. <sighs> wow. Of course, it's gonna be uh, not a smooth ride to do that, okay? Verse, or chapter five, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. There you have it. That's the uh, confirmation that we are going to the, uh, to the Gentile side. I'm gonna move my thing here because I just realized I don't like the way that light is. And we're going to see if this makes a difference. I'm using a different light today. Okay, let's keep it. We'll do this, all right? All right, um, verse two, chapter five, verse two. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs uh, with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had, uh, he had often been restrained with shackles and chains but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Remember? The demons know who Jesus is, and that's who's speaking here uh, through the man. For he had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Yeah, see, so the way that the narrative gives it from man's perspective, but it, it tells us afterwards that, oh, by the way, <laughs> Jesus had said to the man, he tried, Jesus was trying to perform an exorcism, but we didn't, we didn't get that. Uh, we, we, we just got the experience from the man, which is interesting. Um, verse nine, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion, yeah, many, uh, like thousands of soldiers. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So there's many demons. There was a bunch of demons in this guy, not just one. That's the, the meaning of the word Legion, right? Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding. And the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. I think they probably said, sounded more like this. Send us into the swine. Let us enter them. <laughs> so he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned to in the sea. This is an exorcism, and it is an exorcism to parallel the exorcism Jesus had already done amongst the Jewish people 
This is an exorcism amongst a Gentile people using a Gentile uh, classic uh, icons of that, which is the, the unclean uh, animals. Um, this act is of exorcism is an act of inclusion by Jesus. Uh, everything, uh, Jesus is, tr is drawing the Gentiles in just like he's drawing the Jewish people out. Every, they both have the same problem. They both have the same problem. Jesus here is taking actions that eliminates the problems on both sides, okay? Okay, verse 14. The swineherds, a swineherd is a, uh, you know, a shepherd, is, a shepherd is a herder of sheep. Well, a swineherd is a herder of pigs. Uh, the swineherds uh, ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see that it was, see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood as he was getting into the boat. The man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. He's like, oh, but Jesus refused and said to him, Go home and tell your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. The Decapolis is a, a 10 city, um, a 10 a little Roman uh, designation of 10 cities there. The Decap, Deca, 10. And um, the man asked to go with Jesus. Jesus says, no. The idea being, it's not time, but this act of exorcism is intended to destroy the barriers that are keeping the Gentiles from also experiencing the kingdom of God. Remember, the, 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 the kingdom of God uh, gets rid of those things, those obstacles that have been uh, troubling, those things that have come in the way. Jesus is... Eliminating obstacles. That's the kingdom where obstacles are eliminated. Verse 21. Okay, yeah, so when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, oh, synagogue, so, oh, so he crosses the sea again, and um, now he's on the Jewish side, okay? Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. So this is a kind of a sandwiching technique. He's gonna come back to that Jairus daughter story, but not before uh, doing another healing story about this hemorrhaging woman. Notice the 12 years. 12 is a symbolic number, very Jewish number, right? This emphasizes the fact that Jesus is back in Jewish territory. Verse 26. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said... If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone, out, gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Verse 35. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, uh, that's the leader, the synagogue leader, uh, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. 
He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came out, when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, that's Aramaic, uh, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. There's that number 12, symbolic, Jewish number. Remember, this is a Jewish healing. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. That's the pattern, right? The kingdom of God gets rid of those demons. The kingdom of God uh, dispels that realm of the world, uh, that realm of existence, that, that realm of existence which controls us, but we can't see it. Notice the balance, Gentile and Jewish, Gentile and Jewish. Verse, or chapter six, he left that place and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, his hometown, Nazareth. We, we've been told that before. And many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus says to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. So remember this thing I mentioned earlier about the outsiders and the insiders, right? Jesus has already said, hey, these people around me, these are, who are my sisters and brothers and mother? It's those of you who are around me. Jesus defines the new family, the new family of God as those people who are with him. Uh, blood relative, blood relation doesn't matter anymore. Uh, the, 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 the pull of, oh, I gotta be the same as my father or my mother or whatever. Like, it's like, it's like the family religion. All of that is like, is, is being thrown out the window. All that matters now is, are you in and amongst those people who are uh, all around Christ? Okay. Uh, we're in the second half of verse six in chapter six. Then he went about among the villages teaching. Excuse me. Seven. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. So this little section here is where we now see Jesus grooming his followers to do the same thing that he had been doing. The point is not that he wanted, uh, he wanted us to just, just, uh, to, to just be with him and be about him. He wants us to learn from him, to take on those tasks, to, to see those, those, those deeds, those great deeds that he is doing. We're supposed to do the same exact thing, okay? And now we're gonna get a little story. Oh, oh, let's just go ahead and read it. Verse 14, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others, says, uh, but others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. 
But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now we go into a flashback, okay? Okay, I'll get into it after the flashback. Okay, here's the flashback. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison and on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and her guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her, mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's hand. He went and beheaded him on the prison, in the prison. <laughs> he went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Why are we getting this story now, this flashback? Jesus is, or, or, or Mark is, uh, painting the picture that the way J uh, John's disciples were with John and John's fate with regard to Herod same thing's gonna happen to Jesus. He's not saying that yet, but it holds as a pattern that Jesus' life is going to take on. And the idea being, uh, one of the main things here is not, it's not just the prediction of his death, but the fact that the role that the disciples play, the role that the people around him play, and uh, Jesus, remember what he just got done doing. He had just got done, uh, 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 commissioning them to, to go out to, to be like him, right? And now we get an example of uh, John the Baptist and something, and, and a J Jesus-like figure, and the behavior of the disciples of John, or we're supposed to be, uh, the, the disciples of Jesus are supposed to be just like the disciples of John. So the, this whole section here is about Jesus training his disciples to be like him and, and give them a picture of what is to come. We don't get that. Uh, the reader, we get it. Uh, the disciples, they weren't getting it. In fact, the disciples were so obtuse to all of this. They weren't getting it. Verse 30. The, the apostles, now they're called apostles. What does the word apostle mean? The word apostle means sent. Sent one. Apostoles. Apostello. The apostles. So this is a, there's only one other time that they might be called that in Mark, but they're not called apostles until they have been sent, and that's what they had done. So they're called apostles here, but the disciples, they're called the, they are the disciples, but they are specifically apostolic in their function. The apostles got Jesus is here trying to get in. He's got trying to get in with his people, with his with his disciples that they're gonna have to do what he's been doing. And here is an example of it. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves, but many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried down there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So this isn't a crossing of the river, or the, 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 of the lake. Anytime they cross it, uh, as he's going from Gentile to Jewish side, this is just a relocation along the shore. So it's still a Jewish crowd is the idea. When it grew late, 
His disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Ah, he's training, remember? They said to him, are we to go and buy 2,000 denarii of or the bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, well, how many loaves have you got? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. Jesus is training them. He is showing them by example. He is giving them tasks in training. Okay, this is active training. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. 12 baskets, 12, Jewish number. That's what confirms that we are listening to a Jewish story, a story that he is, uh, this feeding, there's gonna be a later one though with the Gentiles. This feeding is for the Jews. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, while he dismissed the crowd, after saying farewell to them, he went up the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. When he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came toward them early in the morning, walking on the sea. Remember we had a thing earlier where um, we had that stormy ride, that stormy, and he stilled the, the calming, the, he stilled the sea when they were on their way to Gentile territory. Now um, he just finishes this big training event amongst the Jewish people uh, for the disciples, wanting them to start to get that they're gonna have to do what he's doing when he's gone. They don't know that yet though. Okay, so here, uh, so there, let's start again. Verse 48, when he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were utterly astonished for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. This is all about the disciples not getting that Jesus is grooming them to be the church. Jesus is grooming them to be him when he's not around. And when it says that they didn't understand about the loaves, that's what that was. But their hearts were hardened, which means that they, not only did they not get it, but they were like closed off. They weren't even open to getting it. So this is a harsh judgment of the disciples uh, and, a, and a clear I think of like, not only, not only were they like, oh wow, we just don't get this. They didn't even get that they didn't get it. Their hearts were hardened. Okay, let's finish this up. Verse 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. So there you have it. Um, and Jesus continues his ministry of healing. The kingdom of God dispels those elements those roadblocks that exist in life that keep us from experiencing God and a full and abundant life. And it is intended to impact our 
our here and now. It's not just a pie in the sky, by and by in the future type of a thing. The element that got introduced this week, though, that we're going to see continue is that the disciples are just not getting it. And not, not just not getting it to the point of they're confused or don't understand, but they harden themselves. They, they, they block themselves. They, they, they resist it. They actively resist it. And we see Jesus uh, painfully uh, wanting to restore all humanity to God, uh, whether they're Jewish or whether they're uh, a, a Gentile. And the disciples just aren't uh, a part of that. And what it is, is an, it's an indictment about us and the way we can sometimes be with regard to God. Uh, in that we will uh, act, even though we, we call ourselves one um, of God's own and amongst God's own, but yet our actions are clearly antithetical to that reality. This is where the story of Mark is going. So this is our Advent uh, study. Um, uh, join me next week when we'll cover uh, chapters seven, eight, and nine. Uh, remember, there's only 16 chapters, so that'll be session three of five. Um, I hope that getting the gospel in these broad strokes, uh, this gospel of Mark, will uh, in, uh, aid to your appreciation for what, the, what Mark's story is about, how it is that he tells it, and the specific way in which he presents Jesus and the, the, the you know, when, uh, you know, Art people who look at paintings, you know, they see strokes and stuff of, of the painting, and of the painter. It's like, oh, and this is the painter doing this, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're appreciating these strokes that the, uh, that the artistic uh, narrator, the gospel writer, is putting in there. And we're appreciating them for what they are and what they add to our experience of his gospel. Thank you, everybody. Blessings on your Advent.